It's time for another episode of the Franchise Business Radio Show, broadcasting live from the Pro Business Channel studios in Atlanta. Sponsored by Franchise Intellect, knowledge and insight of the franchise community for franchise selection. More info at FranchiseIntellect.com. Also made possible in part by Franchise City, a better way to buy a franchise. More info at Franchise.City. And now here's your host, Pam Curry. Good morning. Welcome to the Franchise Business Radio Show. This is your host, Pamela Curry. And the Franchise Business Radio Show is a platform for bringing together franchise professionals and resources to connect, educate, and collaborate to serve the franchise community and consumer. We have got a full studio today. I'm really excited to introduce our guest. And for those of you that are regular listeners, I think you're going to recognize this uh, this first guest. We have John Q in the house. Welcome back, John. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> so happy to have you back back in the house. And, and just to give our listeners a little teaser, what are we going to be talking about today, John? Well, today I've got an exciting topic. I'm going to be talking about taxes and as, as they relate to small business owners and franchisees and helping people hope, hopefully be organized and save a little money on the tax side. Okay, taxes don't excite me, but being organized and saving a little bit of money does. So I look forward to getting into those tips. Well, I then I have to reorganize my introduction for next time, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Happy to have you back in the studio. Thank you. Uh, we have our first time guest. Welcome, Howard. Thank you for having me in the studio, Pam. We've got Howard Page with Team Logic. And um, just would you like a little teaser from me as well? We would welcome it. So Team Logic IT is we're a locally owned franchise in the Midtown area, but we're part of a very large about 160 franchises all over the U.S. Wonderful. Looking forward to diving into that and learning a little bit more. In addition to the studio, we have uh, Greg Benaj in the house. Welcome, Greg. Thank you, Pam. Appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. And Greg actually is a franchisee with First Light Home Care. That's correct. My wife and I just uh, launched our business a couple of months ago. We had our soft launch in January. And admittedly so, I have been waiting to bring you in as a guest. And I was just waiting for the, the exciting launch date. And I know you have a grand opening that's actually coming up on Thursday, March 21st. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Ribbon cutting ceremony at 3 p.m. We're going to talk about that a little bit later okay. as well. Uh, but, but before we dive into that, um, I just want to give our listeners a little bit of a backdrop on you. And That'd be great. Let's talk about how what led you down this path. Greg, you actually spent the past 10 years with U.S. Bank in several product management roles with within the retail payments business. You also manage credit card royalty marketing and product strategy, new product development, competitive intelligence and customer engagement and loyalty initiatives, all of which I'm sure is going to play as significant experience that you'll be able to apply to your current business. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, maybe not so much the new product development, but I think the uh, the mar- marketing. the more traditional tactical marketing elements of the job and the competitive intelligence, that sort of thing, um, definitely, definitely has a, an important role to play. Prior to joining the bank, you actually spent more than 10 years in a small business, first as an entrepreneur and then as an executive, and then that business was sold. Is that correct? Yeah, I had an opportunity in the mid-90s to start a business with a friend of mine. Uh, We grew the business for about four years and then sold it to a somewhat larger company. Uh, And I kind of came along as part of the package deal with that and uh, went to work at the new company managing our products. Um, and stayed there for six years and then left as the executive in charge of product development. So in that time, we had grown from, we were under a, a million dollars in revenue the year I got there, and we were well over six million when I left. So I got to see a lot of growth. And it, was, it was a good experience. Yeah. And, and what's exciting about this new business venture that you're tapping into is you're getting to do it with your wife, Maria. Yeah, it's very special. I mean, I, I think it's um, these days, especially starting out it. At, at least in first light, it seems to be fairly uncommon um, where uh, a team goes all in like Maria and I have uh, and where both of us are working in the business. So um, we'll see how it goes. There's there's some challenges and stresses that go along with that Absolutely. as well. But um, it's going to be pretty special, I think, and something we really look back on and, and appreciate. Well, we definitely want to give a shout out to Maria. Uh, Maria, if you're out there listening, I know I know that <laughs> I, I know you're you're manning the, the shop there and uh, wish you were in the studio. By the way, one of my I had the opportunity to work with Greg and Maria and she has a beautiful voice. And uh, Maria actually is from Moscow. 
Moscow Russian Federation. That's right. Uh, spent three years working as a nurse after graduating medical school. So I can see how this is obviously uh, first light home care is a natural fit with that background. She may tell you otherwise. She she, <laughs> she did medical college and. Um, and then made a career transition out of that uh, <laughs> and went into more of a business support uh, function where she really built her career in her, in her 20s. And, um, but, yeah, it's kind of coming full circle for her to some extent. Oh, that makes sense. And, and, yeah, with her background, I know that she gosh, she has a couple of degrees, a master's degree in English language and linguistics as well. Right. That, that She went back to school and, <laughs> and did that after, after her medical career. So Excellent. Well, I'd like to... Talk a little bit about some of your personal experiences, yours as well as Maria's, that kind of helped lead you into this current business decision around First Light Home Care. Yeah. So when we reached out to you and, you know, started talking to you about helping us find a business opportunity, we kind of put together a list of sort of the things we were looking for. And I remember saying, you know, uh, senior care or home care needs to be on a list. But we wanted it to be we wanted to make sense as a business, first sure. of all. And then second of all, we wanted it to be personally meaningful for us. Um, and so, you know, especially after my experience uh, in the credit card space, good business. I learned a lot. I, I had an opportunity to do some exciting things. Um, but credit cards aren't particularly meaningful for me. Mm-hmm. And so finding something like that that was going to be, um, you, you know, so, something that uh, was fulfilling in addition to making sense of the business. It was definitely something that we were looking for. And as far as our personal experience, so we were both family caregivers. Um, we were primary caregivers for my mom over the last four plus years of her life. Mm. Um, and then before we even met, Maria was her grandmother's primary caregiver in Moscow uh, for many years. Mm. And so, you know, we knew from firsthand experience, you know, the need for these kinds of services. Um, and we also knew firsthand sort of the, the anxiety, the stress, and the uncertainty that families can go through when they have to make these kinds of decisions. So, you know, those those personal experiences definitely kind of had our thumb on the scale as far as looking for an opportunity in the home care space. So you kind of already touched upon it. I guess this is a two-part question. Kind of give us a high-level overview of the startup process for you? I'll make that part one. Yeah, I mean, I guess going all the way back to the beginning, really the first thing after some sort of, you know, the kind of online Google research that everybody does probably when they start (laughs) thinking about this, we reached out to you, gave you, you know, had some conversations, talked about the things that we were looking for. You came back with a list. First Light was on that list. We kind of pretty quickly focused in on a couple of opportunities and explored them in more detail. But I would say within a couple of months, we had, we had really settled on, on home care and were looking at First Light in earnest. Then there were probably the usual sorts of meetings with account executives talking about the opportunity, some of the, the details around franchising, looking at some of the, the average numbers, you know, which have all the strengths and weaknesses of average numbers, and trying to get a realistic sense of what the opportunity was from that. And then we went to Discovery Day in Cincinnati, uh, where we got a chance to meet the executive team, the the whole corporate team there. And and that really kind of sealed the deal for us and, you know, meeting them and hearing their sort of why, why they had gone into this business, why they were building the business and finding that their values kind of aligned with ours. I was just going to ask you, what was it about First Light that really impressed you? Yeah, I mean, I think all home care franchise organizations say a lot of the same kinds of things, but then you can you can kind of get a sense for if if those values and that culture that they talk about, if it really informs everything that they do, mm-hmm. when you find out, when you start finding out, you know, how their operations work, how they treat their franchisees, all of those sorts of things, you can kind of see if they, if they walk the walk and talk the talk, you know, I mean, Absolutely. Um, and so I think that was, that was important for us to see how those values inform what they do and how they do it. And then just the experience of the team. So Jeff, uh, Jeff B is the founder of First Light, has long experience in the home care industry as an executive before he built his company. And he really did it as a, as a way to, to build something with his family. His, his son, uh, Devin, works in the company as well. So it was just, I, I think, impressed us that 
their values and their culture seemed to align with with our values and the culture that we wanted to build. Yeah. So, I mean, just to kind of summarize what you just said there and, and listening, you know, aligned with the purpose, the values, the fact that there was deep experience, the business model worked, the financial model works. And to your point, uh, aligning with you from a culture and philosophy standpoint. Yeah, exactly. It, it sounds like all of those. Wonderful. Uh so tell us, uh, I want to hear about your business. Congratulations. Like you said, you well, just, you. <laughs> it's an exciting time. I, I know it's a, it's a hectic time as well. So I appreciate you taking, carving out some time to come into the studio. Tell us about the kind of services that First Light provides and the people you provide them to. Sure. Well, we provide, uh, really, it's, it's divided into two categories of care. So caregivers can provide what's called companion care. And that could be just companionship. It could be light housekeeping, meal preparation, laundry, those sorts of things. And then there's a personal care side, which is more of the hands-on care, help with bathing, toileting, uh, grooming, things like that. So those are the kinds of uh, services we provide. It's all non-medical, so we don't provide any medical care. And the sorts of people we provide them to, it's primarily seniors, uh, but it could really be anybody that needs a little bit of help staying independent in their home. So it could be, you know, veterans, wounded warriors. It could be uh, disabled people. It could be even new moms. We won't help with the baby, but we can help mom um, if she needs some help after the uh, the baby comes home. So, Or I would imagine if you had an unexpected injury. Uh, yeah, exactly. Rehab. People recovering or rehabbing from an injury. Exactly right. Makes sense. Well, I've always found that interesting that when people want to help a new mother, they want to help and care for the baby. And what she really needs is practical help, making dinners, cleaning yeah. the house, and things like that. So you're you're on the right end of the yeah. spectrum there, for sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally agree. Uh, so you just launched a couple months uh, ago. Yeah, or, that's right. Right? How's it been going so far? It's been going really well, and I think it's been going well in a way that is a great learning experience. We are up over 100 hours a week, which is kind of where our business plan projected us to be in June. But about 80% of those hours are with one client. She's on the waiting list in an assisted living community. So we know, we don't know exactly when, but we know at some point, you know, she's going to move on and go to her assisted living community. And so th- this is one thing we've discovered about the business is that you always have to stay proactive and always, you know, be developing those relationships, building those relationships that will b- bring in new clients Absolutely. because otherwise it's constantly, you know, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back as you try to, to build up your business. So, uh, but we're off to a great start and we're, we've met some fantastic people and it's been great so far. And that's a pretty universal theme when you think about a business ownership, right? And that's client acquisition. There's a natural attrition that's going to happen just depending on the type of business. So sure. kind of keeping that regular client flow yeah, exactly um, right. in place. Uh, and there's such a great need. I like to refer to this type of business as a need to have business versus a want to have, right? Uh, definitely a necessity there. So what, what are your plans going forward? Well, my side, I'm kind of developing relationships with referral partners, both partners that we can refer clients to. So for example, an assisted living community, If we have a client who kind of ages out of our scope of care, we want to know, you know, what's what's a good community if they're looking for an assisted living community? Who should we who should we send them to so that we can be really an advocate for our clients before, during and after, you know, they have a a business relationship with us. Uh, But then on the other side, you know, a lot of new business can come our way if we're able to build relationships with assist living communities, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies that do the medical side but don't do, you know, what we do um, with hospitals, with, phys- you know, doctor's offices, financial advisors, accountants. Maybe you're, you know, doing taxes or estate planning for a senior and they want to stay in their home and they've been talking to you about it, but they need some help, you know, that we want to develop relationships with, with all of those professionals that interact with our clients on, a, you know, on a daily basis. So. Yeah. That's a brilliant thing that you're doing in that so many people look at other industries as competitors. And if you look at it properly, you can say somebody that you perceive as a competitor can be a very strong referral partner or alliance. And that's that's something I stress to my clients all the time. And that's a, that's an important, huge step. 
that, and that's a business owner best tip, right? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, Can I, another thing? Yeah, please. We just had my in-laws move from their own home to uh, independent living. Mm. So at what point do you find that you're talking to people and saying, you know, being in this house, with, even with our help, is a little bit too much? In a lot of cases, it has as much to do with the house as it does with the uh, person. So if you've got a ranch house where everything's on one level, or if you're in a independent senior living home, you know, a home that's been designed for seniors, I mean, with the right care, you know, they can stay in that home, you know, a long time. Uh, and, you know, in other cases, it, stairs just become an impossible obstacle. And then you're looking at, you know, you're, you're going to move one way or another, or you're going to have to effectively retrofit the house with, with elevators, mobility devices, stuff like that. At that point, you know, it really, it really gets um, just impractical to stay in a home. As far as the patients or the clients themselves, I think there are different considerations with different people. But, you know, one thing is if, you, if they're on the dementia spectrum and they get to the point where they're a wandering risk, at that point, they really need to go to a community that has memory care and has a, a locked area to provide care for people who, who might otherwise wander out on the street Absolutely. and forget where they are, forget where they're going, and, you know, be in danger because of that. You know, obviously, if, if mobility becomes so restricted, even in a home that, that doesn't have problems with stairs and so forth, then there are places they can go where kind of mobility assistance they need 24-7 is going to be a lot more available. So those are the kinds of things, I think, on the, on the client side that are major considerations. And what a great service, right? Because if you can keep your elderly mom or your elderly father, aunt, whoever it may be, in the comfort of their own homes as long as possible, I think that's most people's desire. Yeah, almost everybody wants that. Right, um, if, and if, so, if it's possible, right? And, and on the financial side, in general, several hours of home care a week, staying in your own home is going to be a lot less expensive than an assisted living community, you know, certainly a skilled nursing facility. Um, so if you don't need that and you do want to stay home, it can make financial sense as well. Absolutely. So um, if someone is in a position and they need your services, how do they go about getting in touch with you, Greg? They can either go through the website. It's uh, nwatlanta.firstlighthomecare.com, or they can call our office. And what is that office number? Not to put you on the spot <laughs> as, uh, as the new owner. It's uh, 470-689-0867. Say it again. 470-689-0867. And just as a reminder, First Light Home Care, Greg and Maria Banaj are having their grand opening. The ribbon cutting is on Thursday, March 21st at 3 p.m. And the actual event is happening between 4.30 and 6.30. And it looks like we kind of have two different addresses here. But if you make it for the ribbon cutting, that's at 1755 The Exchange Southeast Suite 335. That's our office, yeah. That's your office space. The real fun begins at the Punch Bowl Social, which starts at 430. Right. And everybody's invited. Everybody's invited. <laughs> Grandma, Aunt, Aunt Betty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The Punch Bowl Social is at 875 Battery Avenue, Suite 720. Yes, yeah, so it's at the Battery by SunTrust Park. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. Thank you. So excited to have you on the show. It was it's a real pleasure. A, yeah, it was a pleasure to, to work with you to get you to this point. Very confident that you're going to be highly successful. I appreciate it. Thanks again um, for having me on. Yeah. Have some congratulation gifts for you a little bit later. (laughs) Uh, Well, I'd like to go ahead and go to our next guest. And um, I'm already trying to figure out how to use your services, Howard, because I'm in deep need as a small business owner. Tell us a little bit about Team Logic IT. So our, our goal at Team Logic is to be the IT department for small and medium businesses. You could make the argument any business under, certainly under 50, but maybe even under 100, shouldn't have a full-time IT person. It costs more, and indeed, there's been a number of Team Logic owners who've gotten business because the guy quit, and suddenly (laughs) you go from having 
your IT resources taken care of to having nothing. And it's pretty scary when that happens. Yes, it is, because we're highly dependent on our technology. Yes. <laughs> I have several questions for you. But before we dive into those questions, I just want to share with our listeners a little bit about your background. You actually, at Howard Page, and you were involved in high tech and cybersecurity for many years. And last year, you actually made the decision to start a Team Logic IT franchise in Atlanta. In addition, your work and helping small businesses, you navigate the complicated world of technology, which we all know is very complicated and forever changing. But what really intrigued me is, is you teach a course on creativity at Emory, UGA, and KSU. Tell us about that. So it, it's come out of probably most of my life worrying about how does the universe come to be? How do you get organization from disorganization. Oh, please do tell. <laughs> and, and after reading and thinking about it for a long time, you know, this is coming up on 50 years probably, I've come to the realization it really is creativity that's a universal feature. It's something that's built into the universe and it's how the universe creates new things. And creativity, at least at the human scale, is coming up with new ways to associate old things. That's what a new idea or a new creative thinking should generate. I like that. And that obviously has been something that you've been able to directly apply to your business, Team Logic IT. Absolutely. We we get lots of problems all the time. Some of them are what I would call straightforward. And then there's those that are rocket science, meaning that's not obvious what the solution is. And so we have to go off and think about it some and come up with a solution that meets all of the price and technology considerations. It's sort of that old quote, there's a science to it, but an art to it as well. Absolutely. Makes sense. Could you give us a couple of examples, uh, any client examples that you could share? Well, we have one client that does video production. They have enormous amount, I mean, 280 terabytes of data, and it grows by by the week. They get new clients. They're shooting all the new latest technology. 4K is to them is actually old technology. Now it's 8K. Okay. Um, and so they want us to come up with a way to organize their data so that they have access to the current data. And it's also set up so if a disaster were to happen that they wouldn't lose their business. Mm. And then take the data that they don't use anymore and put it in a nice safe place just in case they need it. So we're actually in the process of designing a system to do that. I like that. And actually, I... <laughs> I need that because I just lost a lot of data, by the way. Uh, well, so as a, yeah, as a small business owner, I would, I, would, I would say to you, I say, wow, 8K, that sounds like it's more and better than 4, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what they tell me. I, that, that's I, our level of sophistication. I will say my, my son has a 4K TV and I have just a basic HD TV and, and 4K is definitely clearer. Okay. More I mean, realistic. And Team Logic IT, it's a franchise, like you mentioned. Who do you service in the Atlanta market? So my official territory is in is Midtown. So the area kind of from where the Peachtree Creek crosses Peachtree Road all the way down to Ponce de Leon and kind of out west to the perimeter and out east to Druid Hills. Okay. How long ago did you officially take uh, the leap into for entrepreneurship? So our official opening was November 1st. And actually, you know, speaking of territories, one of the reasons that I went with Team Logic is that the territory that I have only defines kind of an exclusive to me where other franchise owners cannot directly market. But outside of that, I can get leads in any other, really anywhere in the world. But obviously, I focus on inside the perimeter is really my focus. I'm the only Team Logic franchise in Atlanta that's inside the perimeter. What was your process for getting started and, and transitioning into franchise ownership? So I spent most of my career in, in sales, corporate sales. My last corporate job was with Intel, uh, Intel Security, also known as McAfee. <laughs> uh, I was known there as the ninja salesperson, which gives you a little bit of background on how I worked in the, the creative process. Ninja. Even though people talk about corporations being creative, they do a lot to stifle creativity. You really have to work hard to to foster that. And I guess I wasn't particularly well fostered. So I decided to, to age out of corporate. And I spent a couple years doing my own entrepreneur thing here in Atlanta, and it never quite caught on. And so I decided to look at kind of halfway between corporate and entrepreneurship, which is a franchise. And they have a lot of stability behind you. It's a proven model. I don't have to worry about it. 
I just have to execute it. I don't have to convince somebody it's a smart idea. It's already been, you know, Team Logic had, when I joined, with probably 150 franchises. So there wasn't any decision there. And I went through a uh, recruiter, or uh, I call him a headhunter for franchises. As you know that very well, that's what you do for a living. And uh, and I would, in fact, I would say if you're thinking about doing anything with franchises, you want to work with somebody like Pam because there are thousands of franchises and Pam can help you do the personality test. You know, what are you suited for a franchise? That was a, really the first thing that I did was find out, is that something? And indeed, I I was on the spectrum of being a franchise own, successful franchise owner. And then it's going through the options, just like Greg had said, he uh, had some options and one of them was Sandler, which is a sales training. Yeah, I actually familiar. did. I did Sandler training oh, in one okay. of my sales roles. The so submarine. I mm-hmm. I felt <laughs> comfortable doing that, but ultimately because of my uh, my techie, I was going to say geeky background, <laughs> I decided to go with IT. Understand. And like, I will first thank you for that. And and you're right. It's a process, right? It's really identifying what suits your background, your skill set, your lifestyle, and aligning it with uh, your purpose and vision. I call it a I call it a business vision match, and, and really identifying that. So I want to go back to your business specifically as a customer. Walk me through the process of getting started with you. So what we'll do is initially we'll do an assessment okay. and we'll do both a network and a security assessment. That's part of our onboarding. So we want to know what the current state of your systems are. You have computers, you have printers, you have routers, you have switches, you have <laughs> maybe a firewall, although you're speaking a foreign most language. customers <laughs> I know don't have those. And as I tell these people, you spend your spare time like we have a uh, Atlanta birth center is one of our customers. They're the only birth birthing center in the state of Georgia and they have HIPAA requirements, which are yes. privacy issues. And mm-hmm. so we're helping them work through making sure that they're HIPAA compliant. Uh, and so all of that is part of the initial assessment. So once we have the assessment, we then take over the complete management of everything. Printers, printers are turn out to be probably the most difficult, piece of equipment in an office to make work reliably. Yes. I'm in need of a new printer, too. Yeah. <laughs> I always say technology is my friend and my enemy. <laughs> you and everyone else. Yes. Well, obviously, um, I would put that in the category is the need to have businesses versus the want to have, right? We, we yes. need yeah. this Everyone has device. somebody. What, what usually happens if it's a very small business is they'll have a friend of a friend, um, and comes and helps them out. And then that's pretty common. Or they'll get somebody part-time. And then what we do is we, because of the automation that's available to us, we can actually manage their systems and monitor them 24-7. Mm. So they get continual updates and make sure their systems are patched and cybersecurity is in place and we're monitoring it. And just peace of mind. Yes. <laughs> Knowing that this is all being taken care of, right? Right. And indeed, because we're able to monitor things 24-7, a lot of times we'll find a problem and fix it. And they'll never know it happened. That's our goal. So how would someone go about getting in touch with you to get that assessment and get your services in play? You can always call us at 770 770- Four five zero zero nine one zero, or you can go to our website. You can go through the TeamLogicIT.com website and click location, and we're the only one in inside the perimeter in Atlanta. Wonderful. And what is your phone number again? Seven seven zero four five zero zero nine. One zero. Excellent. Well, so great to have you in on the show. And I might kidnap you and, and take you to my office and get these items fixed. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Howard. That sounds like a really orderly process. But I imagine <laughs> most of your engagements start with, oh, it just doesn't work. I don't know what to do. This isn't and what isn't. And I need it. Yeah. Someday I'll tell you about the security cameras at the Atlanta Birth Center that were installed. And somehow the person who installed them lost the credentials and he couldn't get access to them. Oh, wow. No bueno. We did fix that. <laughs> That's why we're creative problem solvers. Were you ever a miracle worker? <laughs> Thank you so much, Howard. Great advice. Obviously a very needed service. I'd like to go ahead and uh, wrap up the show with our final guest with many of you uh, that are listening are very familiar with. We've got John Q in the studio. And as a simple reminder, John, actually, he's a local. He graduated from 
Emory University, and he became a practicing CPA in 1985. I, yeah, I was the first 14 year old <laughs> accountant in Georgia. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And and obviously, you've been helping uh, small business clients with their accounting, taxes, and overall financial management ever since. Right. Um, I know that many, many, many of our clients and listeners actually work with you, and you really have a focus on franchisees, uh, franchisors. Uh, you work with many multi-unit operators as well as other business owners. Correct. You're obviously based here in Atlanta. You're local. Right. And uh, we're in our favorite time of year, tax season. So I appreciate you coming out and your and your peak well, season. Well, sure. always, always good to get out from behind the computer. So help us business owners out. We've got our franchisors, our franchisees. What What's the biggest mistake now business owners make when it comes to taxes? Well, you know, a lot of new business owners will go in and say, all right, I'm going to get started in business and I'm going to worry about my taxes a little later. And they put off maybe paying their sales tax for a few months. They've put off paying their payroll taxes for a few months. And maybe they don't make any money the first year. And then it just just accumulates and piles up and becomes an obstacle that they can never overcome because it just piles up rapidly. Oh, yes. Um, so would that feed into record keeping? Well, record keeping is a very, very, very important thing. You know, making sure that we understand what our information is and being organized and getting all that done. I've created a, with a partner of mine a little bit of technology that is a debit card that's tied directly to people's per uh, QuickBooks account or to a spreadsheet. So every time a business owner uses that debit card, their information not only goes to the bank, but it goes directly to our accounting system, tracks all their expenses. So when people like you come in on the last day before taxes are due and say, I was up all night, two nights in a row, trying to put all my receipts together, you're terrible and I hate you. Um, <laughs> said, That's not my fault you waited, right? But anyway, this is a way to do that perpetually. And as you go on, that kind of record keeping and having good solid records you know, a tiny percentage of us get audited every year, but being organized, being professional, having everything in good order creates a an atmosphere of compliance that I think anybody that looked at your books would begin to believe you were trying to do things properly rather than just making stuff up. And it reduces a lot of stress and anxiety for the business owner. <laughs> you tell me about that. <laughs> I know firsthand. A common thing that I think we all think about as individuals, but especially as a business owner, is about, you know, deductibles. You know, right. what what are we able to deduct? What are we not? Tell us a little bit about that. The easiest way to think of that is I think a lot of us are very, very good at getting what I consider the ordinary and necessary business expenses, your payroll, your rent, your utilities, your cost of product, and things of that nature. That's like the first category of expenses. The second category that I think most self-employed people are fairly good at are the hybrid expenses. They're expenses that everybody has, but because you are self-employed, you may get to deduct a portion. Your cell phone, your car, your home computer, maybe your home office, and things of that nature. And we're pretty good about that. Again, good record keeping on what you're using it for for business and what you're using it for personally is very, very, very important. The third category are expenses that sort of exist just for the deductibility purpose. We've instituted retirement plans for people. Mm. To a small business owner, that might be just taking money from one bank account and putting it at another and taking a tax break for it. So it's a fantastic savings opportunity. You know, combining business trips with pleasure trips. Just because you're on a business trip doesn't mean you need to hate every minute of being there, right? And so orchestrating what you do and maybe what conventions you go to that are in places that you'd also like to visit would be another good example of that. Mm. You know, finding a way to put some of your dependents on your payroll is another thing that could work. Obviously, they have to do work and they have to earn their money, but putting your kids on the payroll, if they can help out in the office or in the business. I have some clients who take care of their parents, as Greg would know, that 
puts their parents on the payroll because they're actually doing work for that company. And again, good record keeping, showing that they're doing the work and they're earning the money, but that's a way to shift income maybe from your higher tax bracket to somebody else's lower tax bracket. Is it fair to say that there's some creativity involved here too? Well, there might be. And and, and again, you know, we don't want to spend our whole lives trying to figure out how to get around paying taxes. It's a reality. You know, you have to think of it as the government is a 25% partner in your business, and they don't contribute anything directly, Mm -hmm. but they do want their cut, and they want their cut every year, and they have the power to come get their cut if you don't send it to them. And those are just things to consider. (laughs) So on on that note, if you were to get audited, (laughs) what, what does that look like? You know, it's it's fairly rare now. A lot of audits are done, you know, electronically and computer matching. So uh, an individual may get four or five, six, 1099s from companies that they work for. And you need to make sure that your income is in excess of the 1099s that are reported. We always say always report all your income. An understatement of income can be considered criminal as opposed to, you know, possibly overstating an, uh, an expense that's just civil. I would much rather write a check than be led away in handcuffs, right? <laughs> yes. Mm. I don't, but, but remember, orange is not your color. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then the, the other thing to remember is that, you know, most IRS agents are people. Now, they're all people. <laughs> But most of them are fair, reasonable people trying to do a job and trying to take care of business. And they're, and they're just like any other organization. You'll find some that are difficult to work with, some that are easy to work with, some that are reasonable. You just have to deal with them, like I said, as individuals and as people. And if you're organized and prepared and you show a pattern of compliance, that goes a long way to making them feel comfortable with what you're doing. The, the biggest audit area now for small business owners is a lot of, a lot of people are getting audited uh, for their independent contractors. Hmm. And, you know, the government likes to, like to treat them as employees so they get their Social Security tax and then they get their withholding tax. And there's some tests we can do to to see whether they're independent contractors or employees. A lot of times, again, when people are new in business and they've got nothing to lose, you know, they treat as as independent contractors, save a little money, and hope they don't get caught. Just like when they start in business with Howard, and we're not going to have any security, we're not going to have any backup, we're not going to have any data because we don't have anything to lose. Well, sooner or later, you're going to start acting like a grown-up company, and you start have to make decisions to do things properly, and that's that's what we encourage our folks to do. And that this might be the one around a contractor employee. When do they cross that threshold of being considered an employee or a contractor? Well, I'd like to, and I don't really know where that is exactly, but I will say you hire somebody to paint your office, you pay them a flat fee. He brings his own materials. He brings his own paint. He, he maybe brings a helper or something like that. That is a classic independent contractor. A classic employee is a receptionist. You tell her to get there at 8, to leave at 5. You answer the phone and say, it's a wonderful day to talk to John Q. You're in control of everything, uh, the way she goes about her business as opposed to just evaluating the results. So I would say that almost everybody is somewhere in the middle and the closer you want to do. Obviously, having independent contractors that have their own business licenses, have their own tax ID numbers and things like that make it a lot more accessible as as an independent contractor. Excellent. As always, John, thank you so much. Excellent well, business tax tips. Well, I have, I have tips. A, little, a little gift for everybody. Oh, I like when people come with presents. Let me see. <laughs> so uh, for our listeners, what I'm viewing is, is John has just given us mugs. And on the mug, it says, don't get mugged by the IRS. <laughs> don't get mugged by the IRS. Will do. Thank you so much. Well, one John. of the most embarrassing things I ever had was uh, there was actually an IRS auditor sitting in my conference room drinking out of these mugs. <laughs> or one of these mugs. <laughs> Fortunately, he had a sense of humor, too. Oh, this is great. Well, this has been a great show. And thank you so much to everybody for coming into the studio. 
I would just like to go around. If you could please just give your name and the best way for our listeners to get in, ta- in contact with you. Uh, John, how would someone go about getting in contact with you? Well, I am at John Q at John Q com. My office number is 770-395-0223. And remember one thing, always consult a professional. Don't take the advice of some knucklehead on the radio about what's deductible, what isn't deductible. Don't listen to your hairdresser. My mother does that. Sorry, Mom. My mo- mother does that all the time. My hairdresser said that I can. No, so use professionals. Use professionals for your IT, for your legal, for whatever you need, and let's protect ourselves. Yeah, don't get mugged by the IRS. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wonderful. Howard, great to have you on the show. How would our listeners get in touch with you? So our phone number is 770-450-0910. My personal email, or work email, is hpage at teamlogicit.com. You can probably reach us via Twitter. We are IT Midtown. Wonderful. Welcome, Howard, with Team Logic IT and Greg. Yeah, Greg Benage, and uh, our office number is 470 689 0867. And my email address is gbenage at firstlighthomecare.com. That last name is B E N A G E. And this is Pamela Curry, host of the Franchise Business Radio Show. Uh, again, if you need to reach me, my phone number is 847 970 or simply Please send me an email at pam at franchiseintellect.com. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you again for joining Pam Curry and her guests on the Franchise Business Radio Show, sponsored by Franchise Intellect, knowledge and insight of the franchise community for franchise selection. More info at franchiseintellect.com. Also made possible in part by Franchise City, a better way to buy a franchise. More info at franchise.city. Use the social media links here to share today's show and check out more episodes at FranchiseBusinessRadio.com. 